While disaster recovery provides a window of opportunity to invest in resilience, the opportunity is restricted by the damage that just occurred and our urge to return to normal as quickly as possible. We wanted to demonstrate why it's so important to start preparing for the possibilities and not waiting for a disaster before we start acting. We have a tendency to wait until something happens and react with an undertone of surprise, but in reality, there are steps that can be taken now to better prepare. The experience of Christchurch is a really good example of how we need to think through the details of possibilities in the future. Christchurch was not as well prepared for the seismic risk it faced. Our history is no longer a good predictor of our future. There are moments when the world appears stuck, and there are moments when the world can suddenly take a great leap forward. Resilience requires imagination. What challenges will our cities face in the future? And how can we prepare for them now before anything happens? To conclude, we revisit our panel of infrastructure and engineering professionals from around the globe to hear their thoughts on what action we could take right now. We can design for very extreme events. How do we design for the unexpected? We can think about both human infrastructure and natural infrastructure. The first earthquake that hit Christchurch was at 4.35 a.m. on the 4th of September 2010. That was a 7.1. It was some distance out of the central cities. It wasn't the most damaging. The most damaging earthquake happened uh, on the 22nd of February 2011. 185 people died. Um, there were hundreds of people injured and uh, thousands of people lost their homes. That was a 6.3, but it was right under the city. So that had the, the major impact. And a lot of the plans about rebuilding that were on the go after the September earthquake, they had to be put to one side. I wasn't the mayor of Christchurch at the time of the earthquakes, but uh, I have um, played a significant role, I think, in terms of the uh, post-earthquake recovery. In New Zealand, it is a very well-resourced country comparatively when we think about disaster risk management and it's relatively well prepared for earthquakes and other events. However, the experience of Christchurch really demonstrated that when you go through the process of a major event uh, and the recovery from that, there are a lot of things that hadn't been thought through in detail. Christchurch was not as well prepared for the seismic risk it faced because there are other parts of New Zealand that, you know, where, where it is more obvious. We can see the Alpine Fault along our Southern Alps. Wellington obviously has its uh, fault line as well and, and we generally know these things but I think we didn't realise how vulnerable we were and yet we should have. We need to be better prepared for these high impact events. But these preparations should start now. People often try to build back better after a disaster, but is that the best strategy? The challenge that comes with that is time constraints, funding constraints and the limited ability to get everyone's voice on the table in a really quick time. I think one of the biggest obstacles, and in fact it emerged within our discussions around resilience, is the curse of performance management systems within large organisations because they narrow your field of view to a set of deliverables um, that are often crafted to be the easy to reach goals. And, and that's, that's really the uh, tension between the mind and the head, the mind telling me that I have to tick the boxes because I'm obliged to as a local government official, but the gut telling me that there's a lot more uh, in the world than that and that there are difficult questions to ask and that asking those difficult questions can be uh, personally risky in terms of my position as the local government, can be risky for, for my team. Um, and managing that, that danger in desiring to, to ask those difficult questions and to experiment um, around them so that we can make, make progress. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that, you know, planetary scale and complex systems, we can talk about sustainability, uh, and it's an important concept, but that level of complexity is, is 
usually above the pay grade of local government leaders. And so much more useful concept came into the vocabulary, which was resiliency, which was not assuming a steady state or that we're trying to preserve something in equilibrium today, but that things are changing and what do we want to keep and what are we going to have to throw over the side you know, I know that expression, you know, people want to get back to normal, but when there is no going back to the way things were before, then it is an opportunity to co-create a new normal. And that to me is truly what resilience is all about. You know, I remember going to a talk on resilience once and somebody had talked about recovery was, was, was um, the bouncing back. And they said, why would you want to go back? You know, surely it's about bouncing forward. You can get these very abrupt shocks to the global system. They're totally unpredictable. So it's part of fulfilling the prophecy, as it were, um, and therefore has created more believers in the fact that we need to be more flexible in our thinking. And I think that's opened up new opportunities for conversation. I think recognizing that infrastructure interacts with the social system makes things a bit more messy, so it makes it a bit more difficult to do and a lot more intimidating as well. And I think that's also where expanding the skill sets of engineers also comes in. Whatever engineer system we are going to create exists within the social context. And I think if we're trying to build resilience into, for example, an electricity supply system, it's important that we understand, first of all, how is the electricity being used, um, what backups are available, and also just how, how can people respond. I think that uh, what, what it's given us the opportunity to do is to um, build back better in some instances. So uh, in terms of a lot of our buildings, for example, they're built to a much higher standard. So the government changed the seismic standards for, for Christchurch after the earthquakes. Uh, so we've built back to a much uh, more resilient standard. Uh, we've, um, you know, sort of used base isolation in some of the buildings. We've used the uh, smart technology, so the building information management systems uh, within the buildings. It means that if in a, in a future event, uh, you know, engineers do not have to go into some of the buildings to check to see whether they're sound the building information management system will give that information um, from a distance. So I, I think that a lot of people will tell you that um, the way the city is becoming still is much better than the way that it was before. By exploring a range of scenarios, it can help us in deciding where we want to prioritise our investment because we can start to think about what investments are going to be more robust across a wider range of those scenarios. It's not about doing things completely differently, but it's about looking at the decisions that you are making and stress testing those. For example, if you're building a new pipe, uh, could it be a better option to build two uh, smaller pipes in different places to give you a redundancy? It's a difficult decision to make and I think that goes back to the question of inefficiency almost versus resilience because you have to, on a national level, you have to be able to afford those redundancies. And, and the problem is it's, it's not an easy fix. There's, there's no simple way for an engineer working in government or in a private practice to advise client or mayor or leadership that this extra spend, this extra time is going to deliver benefits because all of those systems um, are pre-linked to these normative performance management systems, bottom lines, profit margins. And that's the bigger message of, of resilience, which is why we're saying it has to be a whole of society response because the engineer is almost in a situation where it is not possible to make a cogent argument given the systems that they are working in. We know that uh, we have had to build a more uh, resilient infrastructure, uh, but we now are moving into a future with a lot more uncertainty. If we accept the fact that we should be developing resilience now, rather than considering changes after a disaster, how can we best decide what to do? It's true that there are moments when the world appears stuck, and there are moments when the world can suddenly take a great leap forward. We need to play a dual role in our lives in trying to improve the state of the world and improve the future. 
We of course need to be ready for those great leaps forward. But the way we get ready for them is we continue to engage and we take action day to day, even when it seems impossible. What you find actually is that those years of challenge and of difficulty and of dealing with the status quo and trying to evolve it are part actually of the progress that is made at these moments when there's an opening and an opportunity to make a change and find a way in which change can actually be implemented much more quickly. So what I would say is that we never know when those moments of transformation come along. And the only thing we can do is keep working on what we know is important and essential right now. And then those moments will come along. There is no one decision that is going to be correct in every set of circumstances, across every scenario that we might face as an individual or family unit or society or, or city. And therefore, it's really important that if we accept that risk is about potential and the full range of that potential is not fully understood, that we have to be adaptable. And I think that's even more so now, where we acknowledge that the 21st century is probably uh, the place in the evolution of our species, where our history is no longer a good predictor of our future. Um, and so that ability to adapt, knowing that my decision today, my allocation of resources today, may not be workable, may not be resilient tomorrow, is really important. But that's a huge challenge for government, which is a creature of norm, of process, and of, of standard. The, the evidence of what we've been through over the past 10 years, for me, is reflected in the submissions that we're listening to right now on the long-term plan. So this is our third one uh, and uh, since the earthquakes. And that what, what people are saying, so community organisations are coming to the council and instead of saying, we want this done, they're saying we could partner with the council. So if the council put in this, then we could do so much more ourselves. Um, and I didn't see that the first time round. And I really feel like our communities, our residents associations have picked up the message that we can do a lot more when we work together than when we have an expectation that we pay our rates and someone else is going to do it for us. And that to me is evidence of the learning journey we've been on. I think that the community organisations that are contributing so much on the ground and, and often they're residents associations, so they're based on the local community where they live, taking pride in their own reserves, looking after their own um, areas, helping plant trees and um, getting rid of weeds and things like that. It's more about adding value to the city at the same time as building the networks and the strength within the community itself. So, I mean, it's core critical. I don't think that people necessarily see this as a core critical part of the city's infrastructure, but I do. I think that it is an essential part of the community's infrastructure, and I would like to daylight it, really, and bring it onto our way of not so much budgeting, but, but to see it as having value in its own right uh, within the context of our long-term plan. But that's probably a vision for another, another plan in the future. <laughs> what about when there isn't a known hazard such as an earthquake, storm or other event? Climate change is another good example of why we shouldn't wait for a catalyst to start making decisions. The threats that climate change poses are slow but unrelenting. We can't wait until something happens. We need to start making changes today. The challenge with climate change is that we aren't necessarily going to experience this one big event that's going to shift everyone's thinking. It's going to be more gradual, events are going to be happening in different ways and our climate's going to be changing at different rates. So we need to start thinking about that now and, and accept that there is that uncertainty in the future. One of the problems we've had over the decades is that everyone has had a different theory of change and has regarded others who have an opposing theory of change 
as one of their enemies, right? If you believe that business is part of the solution, then you have one perspective. If you believe that business is part of the problem and we need to dismantle capitalism, then you have a different perspective. And you sort of see someone who has a similar objective as you dealing with the climate crisis as part of the problem. And the movement slightly eats itself. So I think we need to broaden our thinking and be much less ideological about our own view of how we change the world. It's really difficult to go into work the next day and just start to make changes that you feel are going to have a difference. But the idea is that we need to just start integrating this type of thinking in our everyday conversations and start looking at where we can highlight these issues when we are planning projects, when we are engaging with our communities and when we're making decisions that are going to affect the shape of our cities in the future. I still go back to the reality that uh, that you can't predict with certainty anything that is going to happen in the future. Building relationships is absolutely core critical. Knowing who needs to be involved um, after something happens is critical. I think we are all required to be activists, just as much as we need to be doing in our professional um, career, we need to get out of our professional boxes, we need to be putting our votes in the right places, we need to be part of community mobilisation, um, and that's a totally new ballpark for those of us who are trained to be quite narrow professionals, and I, so I think there's a bigger responsibility there, so it's not a simple solution, unfortunately, and not a simple answer. So I think it is um, more about dynamic steering as opposed to um, preservation and I think it's a useful concept when when unpacked in those terms so but fundamentally for me what it translates to is the kind of city that's going to be uh, safe and desirable for my kids to grow up in and inherit one day. In this episode we have focused on planning for and responding to disasters and how considering the possibility of major events might shape different decisions today. To see how the points might resonate more widely, we tested them with our panel. From an engineering perspective, from theoretical knowledge, we can design for very extreme events. You need to actually get across that we're not saying that you're designing for every extreme event. You need to then gauge what is your attitude to how much you want to spend and what is the risk? The question that now really fascinates me is, is this question about how do we design for the unexpected? I think infrastructure operators and engineers already have a difficult job, but to me that seems like a really big challenge <laughs> to throw on the heads of engineers. And I think one of the ways to do this is to make infrastructure systems adaptable but how do you actually do that in practice and you know how do you build in this quality of adaptability how do you treat it am i going to try to avoid it or uh, withstand it accept it you know if things don't go right so it's along the fundamental objective of how do we make something resilient what are the means to make it resilient it's expanded from the traditional disaster management approach which deals with pprr to more dealing with societal resilience economic resilience environmental resilience and having those multidisciplinary conversations throughout our region so that we understand deeply what the vulnerabilities of our communities and their infrastructure is so that we accept that there will be additional events that will impact the functioning of those communities and their infrastructure. Let's invest now understanding those vulnerabilities and understanding what people actually value so that we can build resilience to future events. After every major event, the mantra you hear is, we have to build back better. The actions do not reflect the words. It is very common for the building back to be no better than what was destroyed or damaged during the major event. We take all of the various views about the effects of climate change on wind speeds for structural design and we design for the most pessimistic of those views. And that doesn't cost that much more. What it does mean is that your conceptual designs have to take that into account. And if the conceptual designs take it into account, the additional costs are not that great. And let me repeat what I said a bit earlier on. The most expensive buildings, most expensive infrastructure is the one that fails. 
It was a strong anecdote on how the mayor from Christchurch, the shift from demanding for things from the council for the council to solve, to asking to partner with the council. Our communities, our residents' associations have picked up the message that we can do a lot more when we work together than when we have an expectation that we pay our rates and someone else is going to do it for us. They were able to establish not only an ownership of the problem, but also for the solution as well. Having the meaningful participation of youth is like an insurance for its continuity. So we don't keep making the same mistakes again and again. We have now got some technology that will give us some insight into the health of whatever that infrastructure is. And then we can act before some disaster may happen um, and, uh, and be in a bit better position to be responsive to um, make that system more resilient over time. It's important for all of us to think about how to translate into metrics, all this into the language the decision makers are able to, to understand, that they feel closer to, to, to them. Um, I mean, for example, we, we just say, okay, so we need to build a more resilient buildings. You need to add on the additional whatever to, to prevent future risk. may not be easy to get buy-in from, from the asset owners, but if we build the risk metrics there that will affect the property value, then they will think about how to ensure there is a proper or higher asset value for, for the property. So my key point is to think about the language that can be more effectively communicated with the decision makers. You are at a point in time where policy makers, financiers, asset owners are particularly focused on the reconstruction and the rebuilding. It can be infrastructure, it can be homes, it can be other building, commercial buildings, it can be the environment. So you have a point in time where you are able to influence those policy makers and those financiers. One of the things I, I love most about the term resilience and, and that mindset is uh, it, it provides a framework where we can think about both human infrastructure and natural infrastructure or human um, man-made infrastructure systems and the natural systems together as, as providing services, working in harmony, not as, you know, uh, two separate systems in that sense. Across three episodes of Resilience Engineered, we have presented ideas on how decision-making for our cities and built environment needs to develop and how we as a community must respond to future uncertainty. We have shown examples of what is already happening and how our thinking around risk needs to expand. It's our hope that we've inspired people to have more open and challenging conversations around risk, uncertainty and resilience.